let's go ahead and get started. So first off, thanks everyone for coming to conference today. Just a few quick reminders. Um, conference sessions are recorded and available on Hubelo through the end of October, and they'll be available on the CSHA website after that. Uh, the slides for this presentation will be shared after the conference. Uh, if uh, you have any uh, questions that come up throughout the presentation, please feel free to type them in the Q&A box on the right-hand side of the screen. Um, the presenter will be taking breaks throughout the presentation to answer questions. And just uh, lastly, we will be collecting evaluations for each day and links will be sent to you via email and are also on the conference feed. If you completed an evaluation, you'll be included in the raffle each day. So hopefully you all will complete them. Um, and I think that's it in terms of housekeeping. So without further ado, I am going to turn it over to James Peck to get us started. Thanks, Sierra. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Jim Peck. I'm a psychologist with the UCLA Integrated Substance Abuse Programs. And we are, we put together this uh, training today in conjunction with the Opioid Response Network, uh, which is a project of SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. And the SAMHSA State Targeted Response Technical Assistance Grant created the ORN, the Opioid Response Network, to assist grantees and individuals and other organizations to, by providing resources and technical assistance to address the opioid crisis. Technical assistance is available to support the evidence-based prevention, treatment, and recovery of opioid use disorders. And the views expressed uh, in today's presentation do not necessarily represent the official policies of the Department of Health and Human Services. The ORN provides local experienced consultants in prevention, treatment, and recovery to communities and organizations to help address the opioid crisis. And it, it accepts requests for education and training. So each state or territory has a designated team led by a regional technology transfer specialist who is an expert in implementing evidence-based practices. And there are a few ways that you can submit a request for TA uh, or technical assistance. Uh, you can visit the website, you can email the ORN, or you can use the phone number on the screen. And these, all the information that I'm presenting, this, you'll have the information on the slides uh, after the conference. Uh, for those of you who would like two hours of continuing education units today, uh, this is a start code. So please write this down somewhere. You will need it on the CE evaluation, 8451. And I'll give you an end code when we finish. So write this down somewhere so that you have it handy, 8451. I'll leave it there for another second or two. Okay, so what do we want to accomplish today? Uh, we'd like you guys to be able to identify at least two components of the rationale for using SBIRT with adolescents. We'd like you to be able to recognize the prevalence rates of at least three substances among youth. We'll, we'll look at uh, prevalence rates of a number of different substances at the, at, the big, at the beginning of the presentation. We'd like you to be able to make use of two alcohol and drug screening instruments to detect substance use patterns among youth. We'll go over two specific screeners. We'd like you to be able to identify at least three of the motivational interviewing micro skills. We'll spend in the middle of the presentation, we'll spend some time on motivational interviewing. And then we'll, we'd like you to be able to integrate at least two motivational interviewing strategies into a brief intervention called the Brief Negotiated Interview that will help to reduce substance use among youth. So that's what we're hoping to accomplish today. All right, a little bit of background. Uh, the United States Preventive Services Task Force in 2013 recommended that clinicians screen adults age 18 years or older for alcohol misuse and provide those reporting risky or hazardous drinking with brief behavioral counseling interventions to reduce that alcohol misuse. In some states like California, about a year later, uh, California decided that adolescent Medi-Cal beneficiaries age 11 to 17 are to be assessed annually in primary care settings using the CRAP, which is one of the screeners that we're going to look at today. A little bit of the origins of ESPERT, uh, ESPERT for adults, 
Uh, ESPERT began about 20 years ago with the American College of Surgeons Trauma Committee. And you can imagine why this effort began in trauma centers. Uh, they decided that a trauma center needs a mechanism to identify patients who are problem drinkers for both level one and two trauma centers. And that level one trauma centers also have the capability to provide an intervention for patients that are identified as problem drinkers. And the reason that this began in trauma centers is because a very high percentage of cases coming into trauma centers is alcohol related. Something like 60 some percent, I believe, of cases coming into trauma centers are alcohol related. So this began with adults uh, back in, as I said, about 20 years ago, uh, and has since been, in the last decade or so, has been more and more adapted for use with adolescents, which is what we're going to talk about today. Why do we need to address substance use? Um, we know that substance use is a leading cause of illness and death, can lead to unintentional injuries and violence. It can exacerbate medical conditions, so people who have underlying Medical conditions like diabetes, hypertension, uh, sleep disorders can be exacerbated by substance use. It can exacerbate psychiatric disorders, uh, for sure. Uh, as you probably all know, someone who is uh, depressed or has bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, substance use often goes along with those conditions and typically exacerbates it, even though people are typically trying to cope with the symptoms of those psychiatric disorders, usually the substance use makes it worse. We know that substance use induces injury and illnesses, can result in infectious diseases and infections like HIV and hepatitis C. We know that substance use can affect the efficacy of prescribed medications. So if you're taking a prescribed medication and you're also using cocaine or methamphetamine or heroin, uh, those substances can affect the effectiveness of the prescribed medications that you may be taking. And you may wind up needing to take more or less of the prescribed medication to get the same efficacy. We know that substance use is associated with the abuse of prescription medications. In the last few years, as you know, uh, prescription medications have, have become the most commonly abused or the fastest growing uh, category of abused substances. In pregnant women, uh, substance use can result in low birth weight, premature deliveries, and developmental disorders. And if uh, these are using the older terms of abuse and dependence, if, abu if abuse continues for long enough, it can result in dependence. And often, in what we would now call from the DSM-5, a serious uh, or severe substance use disorder. And that kind of substance use disorder often requires multiple treatment episodes to treat it effectively. Um, and that becomes a huge public health burden. So substance use uh, has a major impact on public health. So that's why we're doing this. All right, let's take a look at the prevalence of drinking and drug use among adolescents. I'm gonna show you some data from the NIDA, National Institute on Drug Abuse, Monitoring the Future 2019 study. This is a study that's uh, been done every year. Uh, for the last couple of decades, uh, or since 1975, I think, more than a couple of decades. Uh, and it assesses substance use in adolescents in 8th, 10th, and 12th graders. And in 2019, about 42,000 students from almost 400 public and private schools participated in the survey. So there's mixed results uh, in 2019. There's good news and there's not so good news. Um, any past year illicit drug use among 12th graders held pretty much steady uh, from 2018 at about 38%. Nearly 36% of, of 12th graders reported marijuana use in the past year, and that's far more than any other drug. If you look at the chart on the right-hand side of the slide, marijuana far outpaces any other substance that is used by adolescents. If we look at daily marijuana use, daily marijuana use increased uh, among eighth and 10th graders from 2018. There was a small increase among 12th graders too, but it wasn't statistically significant. Past year marijuana use, the gap between 10th grade and 12th grade is getting smaller, meaning more 10th graders are using marijuana. 
if we look at vi some opioids, Vicodin and Oxycontin, uh, both Vicodin and Oxycontin use among 10th and 12th graders continue to decline from their peak in 2009, but they held steady among eighth graders uh, over the past year. Adderall use declined from 2014 to 2019, so over that five year period, among 10th and 12th graders, but actually increased among eighth graders, which is not a good sign. So we're seeing Adderall use uh, by, and it almost doubled uh, over that period of time from 2014 to 2019. Alcohol use continues to decline. So both past year alcohol use and binge drinking continue to decline in 2019 in all three age groups. So that's a good, so that's some good news. Binge drinking is, is defined as five or more drinks in a row uh, sometime in the past two weeks. Vaping is where we're not doing so well. So past month cigarette smoking continued to decline among all three age groups but daily use of nicotine by vaping outpaced cigarette smoking now in 2019. Daily nicotine vaping was measured for the first time in 2019. Past month nicotine vaping increased from 2018 to 2019 among all age groups. Uh, fully 25% of 12th graders report past month vaping, which equates to one in four and to one in five 10th graders. Uh, in terms of vaping nicotine. If we look at vaping THC or marijuana, uh, past month marijuana vaping increased among all three age groups from 2018 to 2019. And you can see on the, the chart on the left, the graph on the left, uh, how much that increased significantly from 2018 to 2019. That was the largest one year increase for any substance in monitoring the future history. So in the, in the decades that they've been doing this survey, that was the single largest one year jump. Daily marijuana vaping, uh, daily marijuana vaping was measured for the first time in 2019. So we don't have anything to compare it to from before that. But 3% of 10th graders and 3.5% of 12th graders vaped THC or marijuana on a daily basis. And the reasons that teens report uh, for vaping, uh, the majority of teens report vaping to experiment, to see what it's like. Um, those who said uh, to get high or to relax or relieve tension increased significantly from 2018 to 2019. Those who said to relax or relieve tension increased by more than one third from 2018. And those who said, because I'm hooked, I have to have it more than doubled from 2018 to 2019. So some reasons to be a bit worried uh, about those numbers. To relax or relieve tension, we're going to see in another study that we're gonna look at in just a minute, is concerning because it's indicating that teens are using uh, vaping to cope with something like anxiety. So when they're saying to relax or relieve tension, they're really saying, I'm using this to cope with anxiety. So it's, it's not such a great thing that teens uh, learn in their teenage years to cope with things like depression or anxiety by using substances. So why screen for underage drinking or drug use? It's common, as we just saw. It's risky. It can result in unintentional injuries and deaths, suicidality, aggression and victimization infections and unintended pregnancies, academic and social problems, and increased risk for alcohol and drug problems later in life. We know that those uh, kids who start uh, using substances earlier in their teenage years are far more likely to develop an actual addiction or a substance use disorder uh, in their young adulthood than people who don't start using until a little bit later in life. Uh, it's also a marker for other unhealthy behaviors. So drinking, smoking tobacco, illicit or prescription drug use and unprotected sex are all risk factors for each other. And substance use and underage drinking or drug use often goes undetected until it has more severe consequences. So it's important to screen for it early. Why do we wanna screen for youth opioid, opioid use in particular? 
uh, study that was just published last year uh, looked at over 3,000 high school students in LA County and they found that teens who use prescription opioids when they're younger are more likely to start using heroin by the time they graduate high school. The study enrolled freshmen, followed them through their senior year, so it followed them over four years. It was a racially and ethnically diverse sample. I think the majority uh, were Hispanic. It was pretty evenly divided between female and male students. These uh, last few bullet points are the really important uh, pieces of this. 35% of them reported depressive symptoms. That's an enormous proportion of any population. Um, depression in the major depression in the general population has about a 7% prevalence rate in the past year. So 35% is a huge uh, number reporting symptoms of depression. 22% reported symptoms of anxiety. Anxiety symptoms in the general population are about 3% of people in any given year report symptoms of anxiety. So here again, this is seven or eight times that. Uh, so a huge number of students reporting anxiety symptoms. Fully 70% of them reported a family history of substance use. So when this really speaks to the intergenerational nature of substance use, um, with 70% reporting a family history of substance use, we wonder where do kids learn to use substances? Many of them are, are learning at home. And almost 600 of the 3,000 students reported prescription opioid use, so something like Vicodin, for instance. Um, that is 20% of the students in this particular sample, which again is a huge number. Um, nationally, it's much, much lower than that. So 20% of any student population using prescription opioids, um, again, that's a huge number. So some reasons why we want to address these things. And again, with the, with the large number of students reporting depressive and anxiety symptoms, it indicates that, that kids are using or are learning in school to use substances to relieve symptoms of depression and anxiety, rather than having the depression and anxiety uh, addressed in a healthier way. Okay, so what exactly is SBIRT? Screening, brief intervention, referral to treatment. So SBIRT is, is a comprehensive, integrated public health approach to the delivery of early intervention and treatment services, both for people with substance use disorders, but also for, for individuals who are at risk of developing a substance use disorder. So one of the points that I always make with SBIRT trainings is that we are not just trying to catch people who have a diagnosable substance use disorder. We're trying to catch people before they reach that point. If we can catch them while they're using at, let's say, moderate levels rather than severe levels, we may be able to do a brief intervention that helps them to reduce or even stop that substance use before it reaches the point where it becomes a diagnosable substance use disorder. Lots of good places to do this. Primary care centers, trauma centers, and school-based health programs provide good opportunities for early intervention with at-risk substance users before more severe consequences can occur. The goals of SBIRT in general are to increase access to care for people with substance use disorders and those at risk of developing substance use disorders. Try to foster more of a continuum of care by integrating prevention, intervention, and treatment services, and improve linkages between healthcare services and school-based services and alcohol and drug treatment services, which as you know, typically operate in separate silos uh, in our society and typically have very little communication with each other. So we're trying to foster a continuum of care and improve those linkages between those very disparate silos of care. Key terms that we're gonna use uh, this afternoon, screening, which is a very brief set of questions that identifies risk of substance related problems Screeners, we want to be very, relatively brief um, so that we can administer them on a large scale basis, on a population scale basis. Brief intervention is brief counseling that raises awareness of risks and helps motivate a client toward acknowledgement of a problem and then maybe actually doing something about that problem. Brief treatment is usually cognitive behavioral type of work with students who acknowledge risks and are seeking help. It might be a 
three to five sessions uh, with a, some sort, sort of counselor. And then referral to care, we want to help students access specialized care, and that's what we'll wind up uh, talking about this afternoon. So the effects of brief interventions, we know that brief interventions trigger change. A little counseling can lead to significant change. So when we're talking about a brief intervention, we're really talking about something that is five to 10 minutes. We're not talking about a 30, a 30 minute conversation with a student, we're talking about a five to 10 minute conversation. And that can have the same impact as a 20 or 30 minute conversation. The research is less extensive for illicit drugs, but promising. So ESPER was initially validated for use with alcohol, uh, as I said, in trauma centers. We have uh, research uh, using ESPER for illicit drugs. It's not quite as robust as it is using uh, ESPER for alcohol, but we can make use of ESPER for illicit drugs. For instance, cocaine and heroin users seen in a primary care setting had a 50% greater chance of abstinence at a follow-up visit after getting a brief intervention than those who didn't get a brief intervention. Um, there are a couple of reasons why ESPERT may be not quite as effective with some illicit drugs as it is with alcohol. Um, if you think about with alcohol, we have norms. Um, in fact, I'm going to share with you the NIAAA uh, low risk and higher risk norms for drinking. We don't really have that for heroin use. There isn't really a low risk uh, use level of heroin use or methamphetamine use. Um, and we can, in a brief conversation with people, a brief intervention, we can often have them cut down on drinking. Um, many times people are not willing to say, yes, I'll stop completely. They are willing to say, I'm willing to cut down. Uh, and so let's, let's set a goal for cutting down. The question then becomes with illicit drugs, how do you do that with illicit drugs? Again, with something like heroin, which often for people becomes a daily, uh, daily drug, or prescription opioids, same thing, often becomes daily use. How do you cut down um, to a more reasonable or low risk level uh, with something like that? It's a little bit more difficult. So what do we want to do with brief interventions? Ultimately, we want to bring about behavior change. First thing we need to do is generate awareness that there is a problem to work on. And then we want to increase motivation using motivational interviewing techniques and then bring about behavior change. Um, there are a couple of ways we can generate awareness that there might be a problem here to look at, and that is what's the presenting problem? In other words, why are they there to see you today in the first place? It's probably not about their substance use, so why are they there to see you today in the first place? The other is with the screening results, um, and so we're going to, in our brief interventions, we're going to provide feedback about the screening results. If we look at substance use problems among mental health and or primary care populations, um, we're going to see that there is at the bottom of the pyramid, there's a large group of people who are non-users or who are low risk users, and we aren't gonna probably have to do much with them except maybe provide some positive reinforcement, say something along the lines of, it sounds like you're making healthy choices. There's a group in the middle that we might term hazardous and harmful users, who haven't yet reached the level of a diagnosable substance use disorder. And for those folks, we're gonna do the SBI, which is highlighted in yellow, the screening and brief intervention piece. For those at the top of the pyramid, very small, typically group of severe problem users who have a diagnosable uh, severe substance use disorder, we're going to do the RT piece. So we'll do a screening and brief intervention, but then we'll do the referral to treatment piece as well. So we're not going to be referring everyone that we screen who comes up in a harmful category to substance use disorder treatment. We're gonna reserve that for folks who land in a category suggesting that they probably actually have a severe substance use disorder, something that they're using daily or several times a week. Why screening and brief intervention? So the rationale for screening and brief intervention Substance use isn't just a, a problem for us, it's a global public health issue. Uh, it's associated with significant morbidity and mortality. And as with most things, 
the earlier we can identify the problem and intervene, the greater the chance we have of reducing health consequences. Key to successful interventions. Brief interventions are most successful when clinicians relate students' risky substance use to improvement in their overall health and well being. Why are they there to see you today? Draw the connection between that and their substance use. So, as I said, the presenting problem. Why are they there to see you today in the first place? If you're a school nurse, uh, why are you seeing the student today in the first place? And if we can, if we identify, if we screen and then identify risky substance use, let's relate that to their overall health and well-being or to the presenting problem. Why are they there to see you today? How is that might be, how might that be connected to their substance use? So the implications are that as long as specialty care programs or substance use treatment programs are the only places that actually address substance use, most people with severe substance related problems aren't going to get treatment. Virtually everybody with moderately risky use won't receive professional attention that might otherwise have prevented escalation to more severe health consequences. So in the earlier and this is really important with adolescents uh, because we know that the earlier that, that adolescents start using substances, their brains are still developing. Um, and depending on the substance, it can have long lasting effects on their developing brain. So we want to identify and intervene as early as possible. Good opportunities and indications for screening. When you're seeing students who you haven't seen before, when you're seeing students who are likely to drink, for instance, students who smoke, uh, when you're seeing students who have conditions associated with increased risk for substance use, like depression or anxiety or conduct problems, again, we mentioned uh, that all of those types of things are risk factors for each other. So be on the lookout for those. Uh, in those who have health problems that might be alcohol or drug related, like accidents, injuries, sexually transmitted infections or unintended pregnancies, changes in eating or sleeping patterns, gastrointestinal disturbances, or chronic pain. Chronic pain is a, is a huge, um, huge trigger for substance use in adults and adolescents as well. Uh, somebody who's been in an accident and is in chronic pain from, some, from the accident, from some sort of injury, and is put on uh, prescription opioids for the pain, uh, we know that's one of the, the pathways by which people become addicted to opioids um, is by, and, and for adolescents, a lot of times it's not even their own injury, it's their parents' uh, injury. The parents have the Vicodin or the oxycodone sitting in the medicine chest and the, the uh, adolescent is able to access it. Or for students who show substantial behavioral changes like increased oppositional behavior, changes in mood, sudden uh, loss of interest in activities that they used to be interested in, a sudden drop in grades or unexcused school absences. Okay, let's talk about screening. Um, so the drinking guidelines, these are the, the lower risk drinking guidelines. The NIAAA is the NIH Institute uh, that focuses on alcohol and alcoholism. Uh, is that's the name of it, the National Institute on Alcohol and Alcoholism. And in 2011, they put out guidelines for lower risk drinking. And for men, that was no more than four drinks a day and 14 drinks per week. For women, that was no more than three drinks a day or seven drinks per week. Women metabolize alcohol a little bit differently than men do. Um, and that's the reason for the difference in the numbers. And then for both men and women over 65, it's no more than three drinks on any given day and seven drinks per week. And when we're talking about a, a drink, it's important that we're, um, especially when we're screening and asking someone how many drinks they typically have when they do drink, we're talking about a, a 12 ounce beer, a five ounce glass of wine, a three and a half ounce uh, glass of fortified wine like a, a port or sherry, uh, or a one and a half ounce uh, shot of 80 proof liquor. So these are the, the lower risk drinking guidelines for adults. Um, and there is a way that we'll use these in the brief interventions to make use of them uh, with adolescents. 
So introducing the screener is, is really important. If we're just throwing an alcohol and drug screener in front of someone, uh, it can cause a reaction, it can cause them to increase their defenses um, and not we lower the rate at which we get honest answers. So it's important to introduce the screener by saying something along these lines. We're gonna ask you some personal questions about alcohol and other drugs that we ask all of our students. Your responses will be confidential. These questions help us provide the best possible care. You don't have to answer them if you're uncomfortable. And do it in a, in a sort of a, a laid back, kind of casual way that I just did it. Listen, we're gonna ask you some personal questions that we ask all our students. Your responses will be confidential. They're gonna help us provide you the best possible care. You don't have to answer them if you're uncomfortable with them. Um, saying something along those lines, presenting it in that context, um, is likely to get us more on honest answers. Okay, so the two screening tools that we're gonna talk about are the S2BI and the CRAF. The S2BI stands for Screening to Brief Intervention. And we'll talk about what the CRAF stands for when we get to it. Uh, S2BI administration, we can either do it as part of a clinical interview or, or a conversation with the student, or we can hand the piece of paper to them and have them self-administer it. Um, the idea is they're gonna complete the first three questions on it, and I'll show you what these questions are in a minute. If all three responses are never, we're gonna stop there and just provide some positive reinforcement. It's like, good for you, sounds like you're making some healthy choices. If any response to those first three questions is other than never, we're gonna have them answer the remaining S2BI questions and then follow the decision tree on the sl a slide that we're going to get to called S2BI actions. This is the S2BI. So we're asking in the, the past year, how many times have you used tobacco, alcohol, and marijuana? And the response categories are never, once or twice, monthly or weekly or more. So if they answer never to all of them, you're gonna stop there. Okay, good, sounds like it, you're making some healthy choices. If they answer one of those, something other than never, we're gonna continue with the following questions. Do you use, in the past year, how many times have you used prescription drugs that were not prescribed for you, such as pain medication or Adderall? Again, never once or twice, monthly, weekly, or more. How many times in the past year have you used illegal drugs like cocaine or ecstasy? Same response categories. How often have you used inhalants such as nitrous oxide or something that you huffed? Uh, never once or twice, monthly, weekly, or more. And uh, how often have you used herbs or synthetic drugs like salvia, K2, or bath salts? Uh, salvia uh, is a uh, plant sort of an herb that produces mild hallucinogenic effects when it's smoked. Uh, K2 is also known as spice. Uh, it's typically made by spraying chemicals onto some sort of plant material and selling it as synthetic cannabinoids. Uh, in other words, a replacement for marijuana. And K2 or bath salts rather uh, are synthetic cathinones. So they mimic uh, the actions of cathinones, which are stimulants. So they mimic the actions of cocaine or methamphetamine. So we're gonna have them fill out the S2BI. The scoring on this, again, never, the risk category is no reported use. If they answer once or twice on one or more categories of substances, we're going to say that they are at lower risk, but we still probably want to do uh, a bit of brief advice. If they say monthly or weekly or more, then they're in a higher risk category and we're going to do something else with them. We're gonna, uh, you'll see what that is in just a minute. So here are the actions we're gonna take with the S2BI. So no use at all, never on all those questions, just do some positive reinforcement. Uh, uh, okay, I used marijuana once or twice in the last year. Okay, we're gonna ask the follow-up S2BI questions, uh, see if they used anything else and then just provide some brief advice. Can I tell you, can I share with you a little bit about what we know about marijuana use by teens? If they answer monthly or weekly use of a substance, we're going to ask the follow-up S2BI questions and administer the craft. We'll get to the craft in a minute. 
We're also then going to do a brief motivational intervention, a brief intervention. We're going to assess for problems related to their substance use. We're going to provide some advice to reduce or quit. Actually, before we provide advice, we're going to try to elicit a goal from them, actually, with motivational interviewing, uh, and elicit a goal of either reducing or stopping altogether, and make a plan with them uh, that they can follow on a daily basis. If they answered uh, monthly use of a substance, we're going to focus the brief intervention on reducing their substance use and any risky behaviors that might go along with the substance use. If they answered weekly or greater weekly or daily use, let's say, uh, we're going to focus on reducing their use of the substance and risky behaviors and provide a referral to a treatment program. Okay, here's the CRAF. So this is the, would be the second piece of this. And it stands for CAR, Relax, Alone, Forget, Family, and Trouble, which represent the six questions uh, of the CRAFT. So the CRAFT is a behavioral health screening tool for use with adolescents and young adults under the age of 21. It's recommended by the American Academy of Pediatrics Committee on Substance Abuse uh, for use with adolescents. It consists of, there are a couple of intro questions, and then it, there are six questions developed to screen adolescents for high-risk alcohol and other drug use disorders simultaneously which is, again, with the S2BI and the CRAFT, we're assessing both alcohol and other drug use simultaneously. The reason that that's good is because many of the screeners for adults screen for either alcohol or drug use. Um, and so you have to use more than one screener. With the adolescent instruments, um, they screen for both, both alcohol and uh, drug use simultaneously. It's short, we know it's effective, and it's not necessarily designed to be diagnostic. It's designed to assess whether a longer conversation about the context of their use, the frequency of their use, and other risks and consequences of alcohol and other drug use is warranted. Do we need to have a longer conversation with this student about their substance use? The CRAFT 2.0 is the, uh, more, the updated version of the CRAFT. Similar to the original CRAFT, uh, the 2.0 is validated for use with adolescents age 12 to 18. The 2.0 screening tool begins with past 12 month frequency items rather than the previous yes or no question for any use over the past year. So the, the original CRAFT just asked, have you used any of the following substances over the past year, yes or no? The CRAFT 2.0, use like similar to the S2BI, asks how many times in the past 12 months have you used? Uh, each substance over the past year. <clears throat> that new set of frequency questions was tested in a recent study of about 700 adolescent primary care patients aged 12 to 18 that found good sensitivity and specificity. That means they didn't find a lot of false negatives or false positives uh, for detecting past 12 month use of any substance. That suggests better performance in identifying substance use compared to that of the yes or no questions found in the original version of the CRAFT. So the CRAFT 2.0 instructions, if the student answered zero to all the opening frequency of use questions, which we'll get to on the next slide, we're just gonna ask the car, the question about cars. If the student provided an answer greater than zero to any of the frequency of use questions, we're gonna ask the full set of six CRAFT questions. Two or more yes answers to any of the CRAFT questions indicates an elevated risk for a substance use disorder and a need for further assessment. We're gonna talk, we'll talk about the scoring of the CRAFT in a minute. Further assessment may include a follow-up visit with you uh, and or a referral to treatment depending on the frequency of their use and the severity of the problem. So this is the, the CRAFT 2.0 questionnaire during the past 12 months. On how many days did you drink more than a few sips of beer, wine, or any drink containing alcohol? During the past 12 months, how many days did you use any marijuana, pot, weed, hash, or in the foods? Uh, Got to remember edibles these days as well. Uh, or synthetic marijuana like K2 or spice. Or use anything else to get high like other illegal drugs, prescription or over-the-counter medications, and things that you sniff or huff. If you put zero in all of the boxes above, we're going to just answer question four and then stop. 
if you put one or higher in any of the boxes above, we're going to answer all of the questions on the next slide. And those are, are these. So the, the one that we're going to ask everybody is the car question. Have you ever ridden in a car driven by someone, including yourself, who was high or had been using alcohol or drugs? And then if they answered one or more to anything other than zero to any of the frequency questions, we're going to ask the rest of these. Do you ever use alcohol or drugs to relax, feel better about yourself, or fit in with other people? Do you ever use alcohol or drugs while you're by yourself alone? Do you ever forget things you did while using alcohol or drugs? Do your family or friends ever tell you that you should cut down on your drinking or drug use? And have you ever gotten into trouble while you were using alcohol or drugs? So you can see how these are, the, this was designed for adolescents uh, to be relevant to them. Scores here range from zero to six. So on these are the six questions. Each uh, yes score gets a one point. Each no gets a zero. So a score of zero, no, no evidence of risk. Score of one or more is a positive screen and indicates a need for further assessment. Um, a score of one doesn't necessarily mean that they have a substance use disorder. Again, like I said a few minutes ago, this is not meant to be diagnostic necessarily. It's just meant to indicate, do we need to have a longer conversation with this particular student about the context of their substance use? But the likelihood of having a substance use disorder increases with the number of yes responses. So if you see here, with a one yes response, there's a 32% chance of having a substance use disorder. With two yes responses, that doubles to 64% chance of having a substance use disorder. And by the time we get to three, it's 80% almost. Uh, four is a little over 90%. And if, they, if it's a five or a six, it's a virtual certainty that they do have a substance use disorder. So we're going to base our discussion, our brief intervention on how many uh, of the craft questions they answered yes to. So one, one to two, we'll be somewhat concerned with, we'll want to investigate a little bit further, but anything over two, we're going to be really concerned with. And we want to really assess, okay, let's see if we can get a sense of what is this, what does this student's uh, alcohol or drug use actually look like? Okay, I'm gonna pause here briefly and ask if there are any questions before we move on to motivational interviewing. Any questions on screening before we move on to motivational interviewing? Um, Jib, there weren't, I don't see any questions on screening yet, but there were some back when you were um, giving data. So one of the questions was, is the data from the craft obtained through uh, Medi-Cal available for anywhere, for instance, by county? Was one of the questions? Uh, that's a very good question, and I don't know the answer to that. Um, and then one of the other follow-up questions, I believe, uh, regarding the same data is, where, do you know where they can get that type of data or search for it? Um, there is the, um, which one, the monitoring the future data or the, the study of 3,000 high school students in LA? Um, they didn't specify, uh, maybe if you could just briefly mention both. Sure, the Monitoring the Future uh, study you can get, you can go online, it's, uh, it's public domain. So it's, it's NIDA, the National Institute on Drug Abuse, Monitoring the Future study. And they put up numbers every year. So those, the numbers that I presented are the numbers for 2019. Uh, for the uh, numbers from the 3,000 high school students in Los Angeles County. Um, there is a source uh, on list, citation listed on the slide uh, of the study uh, publication that presented that data. Great. And then um, another question just came in. Uh, do you know of any screening tools for both parents and youth? There are screening instruments specifically for adults, yes. <clears throat> um, and I do trainings on SBIRT for adults. Um, so something called the audit, 
for instance, um, is used for screening for alcohol. Something called the DAST, D-A-S-T, is a uh, drug abuse screening test, is used to evaluate for drugs. Um, if the question is, is there a screening instrument that can be used by both uh, students and parents simultaneously, uh, I would say no, although I think the audit actually has been validated for use with uh, people under the age of 18 as well. But typically you would use a different screener for adults than you would use for adolescents. And that's why we're presenting the S2BI and the CRAFT because they were specifically designed for adolescents. Mm -hmm. um, how are providers screening and documenting for this? Uh, that would depend on your local system, uh, what kind of system you work in, whether you're in a school, uh, if you're in a health clinic, um, it would really depend on uh, the, the, the specific system that you're working in. Um, and then the other is, is it, is it screening through a sheet or is it built into EHR? I think that's a similar answer. It depends on your EHR. You can, exactly, it, it can definitely can be built into the EHR. And any adaption or best practices to telehealth? With telehealth, that's a great question, uh, especially with where we are these days. Um, and I, the answer is I don't know. I don't know if there have been any ad adaptations uh, for use with telehealth or not, unfortunately. And then does screening need to be performed by licensed personnel, RN, FNP, et cetera, or can it be done by any level staff member who has received training on how to perform the screening, but not necessarily licensed? Yes, that's a great question. Um, it can be performed by anybody who has received some training on it. So it doesn't need to be a licensed clinician. And then what is your best approach for addressing and engaging students who are involved in substance use with caregivers and other family members? Um, let me hold off on that one until we get to brief interventions. And then we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit when we talk about brief interventions. Okay, great. Um, let's, go ahead, yeah, let's go ahead and continue on then. Okay, great. So we're going to talk a little bit about motivational interviewing and uh, many of you probably have some experience with MI. Um, when we originally uh, designed this workshop to be a three hour face to face workshop, we were going to do a, a good hour or more on motivational interviewing. Um, and we do just keep in mind that we do day long trainings just on motivational interviewing. So this is going to be a more or less of a, a brief overview of um, MI skills and techniques. So what exactly is motivational interviewing? It was developed by Dr. Bill Miller, the University of New Mexico, and Steve Rolnick uh, in uh, England uh, over the past three decades. In their most recent book, they define MI as being uh, designed to strengthen personal motivation for and commitment to a specific goal by eliciting and exploring the person's own reasons for change within an atmosphere of acceptance and compassion a lot of important words in there. Strengthening personal motivation. The implication there is that there is some level of intrinsic motivation for change. We just have to find it. Even if we are, even if someone is saying, nah, I'm not interested in making a change, um, we need to see if we can explore that a little bit further and discover uh, some intrinsic motivation. We're making a commitment to a specific goal. Um, MI originally developed out of, some of you will be familiar with Carl Rogers' client-centered therapy. Um, client-centered therapy is very non-directive. Um, the way that Carl Rogers did client-centered therapy, he would sit with a, some of you uh, may remember from, uh, if you saw in grad school, um, tapes, videotapes of Carl Rogers sitting with a female client and just really listening and reflecting back what he heard and allowing her to take the conversation wherever she needed to take it. MI evolved out of that, but it's not quite the same. It's not as non-directive. Um, it is more directive. We do have uh, a specific direction that we're trying to go in. 
we are trying to engage someone in commitment to a specific goal. And we ideally, we'd like that to be their goal. Um, rather than us telling them what that goal should be. So if at all possible, when we talk about the brief interventions, we'll talk about this more, but if at all possible, we want the goal to be their goal. Uh, by eliciting and exploring the person's own reasons for change. So people have their own reasons for change. Uh, and, and in this case, we're talking about reducing or stopping substance use. Um, we need to elicit those reasons for change from them. We're gonna use some techniques. One is called the readiness ruler. Uh, we're gonna use some techniques uh, called decisional balance to try to elicit from them their own reasons for change. And we're doing all of that within an atmosphere of acceptance and compassion. Um, and that does come straight from Carl Rogers' client Center Therapy. So we're trying to have people, it's, it's an approach that demonstrates respect for people um, and it assumes that there is motivation present if we can find it and then strengthen it, um, help them commit to a specific goal that they have chosen uh, for their own life. The concept of motivation, we used to think about motivation uh, as being a trait as opposed to being a state. Uh, a trait, like a personality trait, um, is something that's deeply ingrained and typically it's either there or it isn't there or it's there to some degree, um, but it's not modifiable. Now we think about motivation as being more of a state and that state can be influenced by the clinician or, or counselor or staff member's style of interaction, interaction with uh, the individual. Motivation can be modified. And so the clinician or counselor or staff member's task is to elicit and enhance motivation. And this is a, the, this last bullet point. Um, whenever I do this with uh, licensed clinicians, it always brings up some reactions. Uh, lack of motivation is a challenge for the clinician's therapeutic skills, not a fault for which to blame our students or clients. Um, and it's basic, this is basically saying somebody who appears to be not motivated at all, maybe we need to modify our approach with them. Maybe we aren't uh, interacting with them in a way that elicits their motivation. Um, now sometimes, you know, this isn't gonna work 100% of the time with everybody, um, but it is saying before we just kind of write someone off as saying, well, they don't have any motivation to change, so they'll probably have to in uh, some, some systems of thought hit bottom uh, before they're ready to make a change. And this is saying, not necessarily. Let's, before we decide that that's the case, let's step back for a minute and say, is there a different way of being that I can uh, be with this person that might elicit from them some motivation? There are four aspects of the underlying spirit of MI. So the spirit of MI, it, we're talking about the spirit of the relationship, essentially. Um, and those are partnership. A good way to remember this is the acronym PACE, P-A-C-E. Partnership, we're forming a part collaborative partnership with the client or the student. So rather than a typical hierarchical relationship between staff member and student or doctor and patient, we're forming a, a collaborative relationship, making a partnership with them and meeting them where they are. We're accepting them where we find them. They, we can't expect people to change if we don't first accept where they are. Um, and so acceptance is an important piece of this. Genuine compassion. I actually care about the outcome here. Um, I care about this person. Um, and that manifests itself in my interactions with them. Evocation is the probably the most, the most difficult to uh, explain, but we're trying to evoke from them their own goals and their own reasons for change. Like I said, we're going to assume that there is some sort of goal there uh, if we can find it, and we want to evoke from them their goals and their reasons for making some sort of change, typically in a harmful behavior like substance use. 
<clears throat> there are four processes of MI, planning, evoking, focusing, and engaging. Uh, I actually read those in backward order. I should have started with engaging. Engaging with them, we want to build a relationship, right? We, nothing, nothing is going to be accomplished if we don't first engage in a relationship with, uh, with the student. And, and that can be done in a very few minutes. It doesn't have to take a half an hour or an hour to build a relationship um, that's based on mutual respect and trust. Focusing. We want to focus the conversation on the specific goal that we are identifying. Um, what is it that we're talking about here? Um, and in, again, in this case, we're talking about substance use. MI was originally designed to work with substance users um, and it has since been evaluated and validated with a number of other types of conditions, everything ranging from anxiety to depression to eating disorders to smoking. Um, <clears throat> and so it's a, it's a very helpful method of helping people to recognize their own goals and then making uh, a commitment to making some sort of change and unhealthy behavior um, that is preventing them from reaching those goals. Evoking, as I said, we want to evoke their own goals and their own reasons for change. And then planning. And Miller and Rolnick say that, that we can be doing MI if we're engaging, focusing, and evoking in any given conversation, we are doing MI. We may or may not get to planning. Again, these are very, very brief conversations we're talking about having, five to 10 minutes. And so we may get to planning, uh, and planning out an approach to uh, meeting a goal, and we may not. We may get to uh, at least evoking a goal. Uh, we may or may not get to uh, coming up with a daily plan for accomplishing that goal. <clears throat> What's the best way to facilitate change? So constructive behavior change comes from connecting with something valued, cherished, and important. With, in some cases, we have to help people remember what they value what's important to them. And intrinsic motivation for change comes out of an accepting, empowering, safe atmosphere where their current behavior can be faced by the student. That we're accepting where they are. This is a very empowering sort of approach. We're trying to help people, among other things, recognize their own strengths and skills. We're trying to create a safe space for them, safe physically and psychologically. Uh, and emotionally, where they can face their current behavior. Um, and because typically what we do, especially with substance use, is substance use remains in denial uh, or repression. It, it stays out of our conscious awareness. We don't really think about it because it's uh, difficult to think about. Where do we start with MI? Where we start, what we do, depends on where the student is in the process of changing. So the first step is to be able to identify where they are. And we're gonna do that with something called the, the trans-theoretical stages of change model. And basically what the model says is that for any of us contemplating making any sort of major change in our lives, we go through a series of stages of readiness to change. Um, and that starts at pre-contemplation. Pre-contemplation is basically, there's no awareness that there even is a problem to focus on. And our primary task there is raising awareness. Next is contemplation. All right, maybe there's something here I need to think about or look at a little bit more, but I'm certainly not willing to do anything about it just yet. Then we go to determination. Okay, yeah, you're right. I need to do something about this. I'm still kind of considering what to do about it, and I'm not sure how to go about doing it. The action stage is pretty self-explanatory. We're actually taking steps toward change, but we haven't stabilized yet in the process. And then maintenance, we've achieved the treatment goals uh, or the goals of the uh, action plan, and we're working to maintain that change. Recurrence is part of, the plan, part of the process for some people, not for everyone. And we're using the word recurrence rather than relapse. Um, relapse has a more of a negative connotation to it, negative stigma. Recurrence is just, it's a recurrence of the symptoms. So if we think about substance use as being like any other chronic medical condition, people experience recurrence of the symptoms. 
Um, and that's often a part of the process. And with substance use, it is often a part of the process, not for everyone, but for some people it is. And we need to remind people when that happens to stay in the process, not to drop out of the entire process because they've experienced the recurrence of the symptoms. Many of the students that you're, you see will be in pre-contemplation. They're not even considering change. Um, they're not even considering that their behavior is a problem. Uh, they, you might see some who, in, who are in contemplation. They may have, uh, even though they may say to us, no, I don't think my marijuana use is a problem, they may still have asked themselves or said to themselves at some point, you know what, I wonder if this is becoming a problem. That's kind of where contemplation is. Um, and MI can be really useful in helping people to raise awareness that there is a problem, that there is something here to look at. And, and in contemplation, resolving ambivalence in the direction of making a change. Um, and we're going to look at a couple of techniques for doing that. So once we've, let me back this up for a second. So we want to match our intervention to the stage of change that someone is in. Because if somebody's in pre-contemplation and I say, what do you think about checking out some AA meetings? What are they likely to say? What's the likely reaction? What are you talking about? I don't have a problem. Why would I go to an AA meeting? Okay, somebody who's in determination, however, who is saying, yeah, you're right. I need to make some change in this behavior, but I'm not quite sure how to go about doing it. Okay, have you considered the 12-step programs? That would be an appropriate point at which to raise that uh, possibility. Um, not with somebody who's in pre-contemplation. Pre-contemplation, we just want to start to raise awareness that maybe this is an issue. Maybe this is something that I need to focus on. Concept of ambivalence. So ambivalence is feeling two ways or more about things, about something. Ambivalence is normal. Um, this lady has a lot of ambivalence. She's feeling a lot of different ways about things. Clients typically come into treatment settings. Uh, students will come into counseling or health care settings with fluctuating and conflicting motivations. On one hand, they might want to make a change or think that they need to make a change. On the other hand, they don't really want to change. Um, and so working with ambivalence is working with the heart of the problem. Ambivalence is a normal part of the process. It's what we used to think of as resistance. Uh, and instead now we think about it as ambivalence. If we're asking someone to give up something that he's, has become part of their daily routine, uh, something that has become, uh, has served a purpose, uh, is meeting a need in their life, if we're just going to ask them to give that up without doing anything else, without replacing it with something, of course they're going to be ambivalent about it. They're going to think on one hand, okay, yeah, maybe I need to do that. But on the other hand, if I do that, how am I going to deal with my depression? How am I going to deal with my family situation uh, that bothers me all the time, et cetera? So working with ambivalence and helping people to resolve that ambiv ambivalence in the direction of making the change is part of the process here. So the spirit or the style of interaction. Uh, between the, again, whether it's a provider, uh, it could be a, a counselor, it could be a nurse, school nurse, uh, it could be a school guidance counselor. Uh, it's non-judgmental and collaborative. We're basing it on a student and clinician or counselor or staff member partnership. Um, I'm in this with you. I want to help you. Uh, I don't want to fix you. I'm not looking at you as the problem. Let's identify what the problem is and see if we can work on it together. It's what we might call gently persuasive. So we're not going to kick someone, drag someone kicking and screaming um, down the road with us. It is, however, kind of gently persuasive, as you'll see as we get into the brief interventions. It's definitely more supportive than argumentative. Uh, the minute you get into an argument with someone where you're arguing that they have a problem, they're arguing that they don't have a problem, you're not likely to get very far with them. We're doing much more listening rather than telling them things or lecturing them. Again, 
similarly with adolescents in particular, the minute it sounds like I'm lecturing them, I've probably lost them uh, because they don't want to be lectured at. And the entire approach communicates respect for and acceptance of the students' feelings and their worldview. Part of what we're trying to do in MI is get an understanding of their worldview. How is it that they view their world? How does their alcohol or drug use fit into that world in some way? Because it serves a purpose. People don't use alcohol or drugs for no reason at all. They serve a purpose or more purposes. They, they fill needs. Um, and part of what we're doing is we're being empathic. We're developing a relationship based on empathy. And that means I understand you, I get you. I understand why you're doing the things that you're doing. Um, I understand the world as you see it. It explores students' perceptions without labeling or correcting them. There's no teaching or modeling or skills training. If we were combining, and, and um, for those of you who are counselors, uh, you'll know what I'm talking about, uh, CBT, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, uh, if we were combining MI and CBT, there would be some teaching or modeling or skills training, but in MI, there isn't any of that. Resistance, again in quotes, is seen as an interpersonal behavior pattern influenced by the clinician's style of interaction. So again, we're not saying, okay, this person's in resistance or they're in denial, uh, there's no way we're gonna get anywhere with them, so might as well end this conversation. We're seeing resistance instead as an interpersonal behavior pattern. And that pattern is influenced by the way that we interact with them. And resistance is met with reflection rather than with confrontation. If we meet resistance with confrontation, and start an argument, again, like I said, we're, they're arguing that they don't have a problem. We start arguing that they do have a problem. We're not likely to get very far. So we're gonna just reflect it back to them. So it seems to you like you don't really have a problem with this. It seems to you like your marijuana use isn't really affecting anything in your life in a negative way, is that right? Um, and then proceed in the conversation from there. And we'll look at how to proceed from there when we get to the brief intervention. While the clinician or the counselor or the staff member can have significant influence on someone, Ultimately, people are gonna make their own choices. So we're going to leave responsibility for making the change with the student. Um, uh, even if the student is making a, a choice that we feel is unhealthy, that we don't agree with, um, we're still going to um, allow them to make that change. We might, at the end of a conversation, let me put it that way, um, if at the end of a conversation, at the end of a brief intervention, a student is still going to make a choice that we think is, is probably not the best choice for them. We need to allow them to make that choice. They're the ones that are going to have to deal with the consequences, both positive and negative, um, and we can't make that choice for them. Change arises from within rather than being imposed from without. People are much more likely to engage in a course of action if they have decided themselves that they need to pursue that change rather than if someone is telling them that they need to make that change. Think about yourself. How much do you like being lectured at? How much do you like somebody telling you what you have to do, right? None of us really likes that very much. Um, and so we need to focus on a, a different way of bringing about change. We wanna focus on eliciting the student's own concerns. Rather, again, rather than us lecturing them, don't you know what this is doing this doing to your schoolwork? Don't you know the effect this is having on your family? Um, instead, we want to elicit their concerns about what's going on. And the emphasis is on their personal choice for deciding their future behavior. And so again, we can have a significant influence, but ultimately people are going to make their own choices and we need to allow them to make those choices. The clinician implies a strong sense of purpose. We're seeking to create and amplify a discrepancy between their more deeply held values and goals and their current behavior in order to enhance motivation. So we're de developing discrepancy as something that we talk about in MI. And what we're talking about there is 
we're seeking to elicit the discrepancy between what are their goals, what are their values, and what's their current behavior? And is their current behavior helping move them in the direction of their values and goals, or is it moving them in, in the other direction? We want to elicit possible change strategies from the student. So instead of us suggesting, have you thought about doing this or that? First, we want to try to elicit change strategies from them. Well, if you, if you did decide that you wanted to cut down on your marijuana use, how might you go about doing that? And it systematically directs the student toward increased motivation for change. Um, yeah, it's, we're, we're having a, a client-centered sort of conversation. Um, at the same time, we do have a destination that we're trying to move toward. We do have a goal. So the, the change, the process of change is a continuum. MI is a style of counseling that aims to facilitate student-driven decisions to change harmful behaviors. It's useful with a person who is contemplating changing his or her behavior, but may be experiencing ambivalence. As I said, it's really useful with someone who is in pre-contemplation or contemplation um, and is just starting to look at their behavior as maybe this is something that I need to think about. But they're experiencing a lot of ambivalence about it. On one hand, okay, maybe I need to think about this or look at it. On the other hand, I really don't want to do anything to change it right now. And when people hear their own words, they're more likely to commit to the desired changes. So we're, which is part of why we're trying to elicit everything from them. Um, I have, uh, when I see patients in my clinical work, occasionally I'll have a patient in, a, in the middle of a session say, oh wow, this is interesting. I'm realizing this is true just as I'm talking about it. When people hear their own words, when they hear their own discussion of something, they're more likely to recognize it as truth and more likely to commit to the change. MI is founded on four basic principles. Uh, here's developed discrepancy that I mentioned a minute ago. Expressing empathy. Um, so again, we're forming an empathic relationship, an empathetic relationship. Um, I never know which of those two words to use. I don't know about you guys. Um, but we're, just, we're developing an empathetic relationship. So again, like I said earlier, we're trying to understand the world through this person's eyes. Um, what is their worldview? And how does their alcohol or drug use fit into that overall worldview? We're trying to develop a discrepancy between their more deeply held values and goals and their current behavior. So on one hand, you're telling me that you want to graduate from high school and go to college. Um, on the other hand, you're smoking marijuana every day. Help me make sense of that. How do those two things fit together? Now, you have to be very careful when you say something like that. Because if there's a note of sarcasm in your voice, you're going to be dead in the water. You have to ask the question as though you really don't get it. You're really trying to understand. Okay, on one hand, you're saying you want to do this. On the other hand, you're doing this every day. Help me make sense of that. Help me make sense of, of how those things fit together. This whole approach, some of you will be old enough to remember a, a detective show on TV called Columbo. Uh, and I think of MI as being a sort of a Columbo sort of approach uh, to working with people. Uh, if you remember how he did things, he was very sort of um, laid back, non-judgmental, um, and he would frequently, he'd, be, he'd finish with a conversation, start to walk away, and then he'd, he'd sort of put his head and scratch his head and, and turn around and say, oh, just one more thing. Help me understand this or that. And it, I think this approach is being something like that. Um, it's very, um, it, like I said, it's based on empathy, it's client-centered, um, and we're developing discrepancy between their more deeply held values and goals and their current behavior, but we're doing that in a very empathic way rather than, a very, rather than being uh, a challenging about it. We wanna roll with resistance, so rather than, um, pushing against resistance, uh, pushing back against resistance. That's where, as I said, we get into a conversation that probably isn't going to be useful for anybody. Instead, we wanna roll with resistance. And so, as I said earlier, it might be something along the lines of, 
So it seems to you that your marijuana use uh, every day isn't causing you any significant problems. Tell me a little bit more about that. What else do you think about that? What else do you think might be going on? Or, or if, you, if, you, if it was causing you some issues, what might they be? Something along those lines. And we're supporting self-efficacy. Self-efficacy is a sense of, if I decide that I wanna make this change in my life, do I feel like I have the necessary knowledge and skills and experience to be able to do so? Um, and so this is an empowering sort of approach. We're trying to help people identify their skills and strengths and support their sense of self-efficacy. The more people feel like confident, um, feel like if I decide I, I wanna do this, I actually can do it, the more likely they are to commit to that course of action. Okay, so briefly some skills and strategies. Um, we're gonna use open-ended questions. So rather than closed-ended questions, which call for a yes or no answer, uh, we're going to uh, ask open-ended questions. And we'll do this uh, in a decisional balance that I'm gonna show you in a little bit. Open-ended questions are hard to answer with just a yes or no, or just a brief reply. They contain an element of surprise. We don't really know what the, the individual is going to say. They're conversational door openers that encourage the student to talk. Um, and oops, I left uh, something in here from a previous slide. Is this an open-ended or closed-ended question? Uh, references a series of questions that we do on another slide and a longer version of this. So just ignore that. So open-ended questions, we're trying to get people to talk right? Rather than asking them a checklist of things and they answer yes or no to each of those, we're asking open-ended questions and trying to get them to answer with more descriptive responses. Affirmations, positive reinforcement, right? Um, whenever we have the opportunity, we want to offer some positive reinforcement. Has to be authentic though. Um, cheerleading is not an affirmation. So, wow, awesome job, dude. That's not an affirmation. That's kind of cheerleading. Um, you know what, you really tried hard to make this change. You didn't get it 100%, but you made a lot of the change happen. Good for you. That's an affirmation. We're gonna support and promote confidence and self-efficacy with affirmations. We can acknowledge the student's challenges um, and validate their experiences and feelings with affirmations. Well, I get it. it. This seems really difficult for you. And reinforcing successes reduces discouragement and hopelessness. If people are feeling discouraged and hopeless, they're not going to engage in, in, a, in a change course of action. Um, so we want to positively reinforce even small steps of progress, something that somebody does on a daily basis you know what, I tried to follow a schedule today. I managed to follow the schedule in the morning, but I fell off in the afternoon. Okay, you know what, you followed it in the morning, good for you. So let's work on, now let's work on how you might be able to do, the, do it in the afternoon. Some just basic affirmations. Thanks for coming in today. You know what, I appreciate you coming in. I appreciate that you're willing to talk to me about your substance use. You're obviously a resourceful person to have coped with those difficulties with your family situation, let's say. Um, you must have some significant resources to be able to cope with that. Just something simple like, that's a good idea. It's hard to talk about drug use. I really appreciate your willingness to be honest with me. Um, again, they have to be authentic um, and empathetic, but we wanna reinforce any small step of progress. Reflective listening, we typically spend a lot more time on um, in, a, in an MI training. We're just going to talk about this briefly here, but reflective listening is really the key tool for expressing empathy. So rather than listening for the sake of diagnosing and fixing a problem, which is what many of us do, what many of us were taught to do or trained to do, Reflective listening instead is used to check out whether we really understood the student. Am I really getting them? Am I really understanding them? We can use it to highlight their own motivation for change about substance use. 
We can steer the student towards a greater recognition of their problems and concerns and reinforce statements indicating that the student is thinking about change or what, what's called change talk in MI. So anytime we hear something that sounds like, okay, this, there is some movement toward change here, we, we call that change talk in MI. And part of what we're trying to do in, in MI is to elicit change talk. Different levels of reflective statements. Just a simple reflection. We're just going to repeat back basically what they've said. We might change a couple of words, um, but we're basically just repeating back what they've said. Um, so this feels really hard to you. Complex reflection. We're making a guess as to the underlying meaning. So we're listening not just to what's being said, but what's being communicated, either sort of the meta communication or the subtext of what's being communicated. Um, wow, that sounds like it, it must have felt really scary to you. That's a reflection that is making a guess as to the underlying meaning. Often that underlying meaning is an emotion of some kind. And then there are double-sided reflections, which capture both sides of the ambivalence. So on one hand, and they, this is the way they typically start is, so on one hand, you're telling me that you, uh, you wanna finish high school and go to a trade school. On the other hand, you're using Vicodin several times a week. Tell me how that fits together. Again, we're developing the discrepancy by using a double-sided reflection. On one hand, you're saying this. On the other hand, you're saying that, and these two things don't really make sense together. So help me to understand them. And then there are summary statements, which are essentially um, reflections. We're just, I think of it as listening to several verbal paragraphs and then offering two or three sentences back, reflecting what I've heard. So it's, it can be a collection uh, of reflections. Uh, a summary can provide linkage between topics, uh, it can provide linkage between a couple of different things that the student has been talking about, or it can provide a transition to whatever the next topic might be. So we're going to use these four micro skills, uh, open-ended questions, affirmations, reflective listening, and summaries um, to implement the theory and structure of MI. Okay, so conducting a brief intervention, we're going to focus the rest of our time on brief interventions. Um, Sierra, any, any questions in the Q&A box before we move into brief interventions. Yes, there are a few. Give me one second. Um, so the question came back up about a best approach regarding use with caregivers and family members. Regarding the, the use of, uh, like the substance use of family members? Uh, best approach for addressing and engaging students who are involved in substance use with caregivers and other family members. Yeah, I, I think it's, you know, that's a really complex one. Um, if they're using with family members or other caregivers, um, you need to start to try to create some separation between them. And you might do that by saying, okay, help me understand what your goals are um, versus what do you think your, your mom or your dad's uh, or your caregiver's goals might be? And how do you think your goals might be different from their goals? and start to try to develop a discrepancy, when we talk about developing discrepancy, um, between the student's values and goals and the parent's or other caregiver's values and goals, um, and start to try to move them, kind of steer them in a direction of what's important to you, and then how is your substance use fitting into that? That's about as good an answer as I can provide at the moment. Okay, um, and then another question, have you ever used brief intervention or motivational interviewing in a group setting or is it best used one-on-one? -on -one? No, you can definitely use MI in a group setting. Um, you can, it is, uh, I think originally it was designed to be used one-on-one, -on -one, um, but you can definitely use, it's, I think about uh, MI as not being so much a set of skills and strategies as being a way of being with someone. Um, and so you can use that way of being whether you're in a group or in an individual session. Great, and then this one is um, more of a statement and I can add to it. So um, assessing substance use and abuse in middle schools is quite challenging. Engaging with the school districts who have zero tolerance policies um, 
do not align with expert fine balance of supporting youth who are engaging in substances. And Heather, who asked that question, um, Lisa went ahead and uh, shared a resource that CSS, CSHA put out our earliest, earlier this year, the School Discipline and Student Substance Use um, uh, report. And then also I wanted to let you know that on tomorrow, the 1230 to 130 session, there's also a Healthy Futures and Alternative Susp Suspension Curriculum Workshop. So that might uh, be of interest to you. Another question that came in is, can these assessments, questionnaires, and screenings be done in the classroom or by trained students or other students on a high school campus? Well, that's a great question. Um, I think that I wouldn't do them necessarily in a classroom, um, but I would, you might be able to train peers, um, train seniors, for instance, to be able to administer. I don't know off the top of my head if any research has been done on that. Um, do you know anything, Sarah, Sierra, by any chance? Um, I don't know off the top of my head in terms of like research and evidence-based, um, but I do know that at the end of this presentation, we're gonna be sharing with you um, a very briefly a peer health education uh, module that can be used for substance use prevention. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, that's I, like I said, I'm sure it can be done uh, using peers. Uh, I'm just not aware of any research that may have been done um, looking at outcomes of doing it that way. Mm -hmm. um, and then one more, like a follow up question to the group question How many students at once is appropriate in terms of group? Um, it, well, it depends on what you're doing in the group. If you're just doing a group screening like this, um, typically we say in, like in group therapy, six to eight people in a group is about the right number. You probably don't want to go much over that. Um, if you're just doing, again, it, it depends on what you're doing and what the purpose of the group is. If you're doing a group screening, um, I would say no more than five or six probably. Okay. Just because you want to create an environment where people feel free to speak openly and honestly. Great. That's it for now, Jim. We can go ahead and keep okay. on going. Okay, great. Thanks, Sarah. Okay, so <clears throat> we're going to make use of MI in brief interventions. We're going to talk about two different models of brief interventions and we better get started on this because I'm just noticing that it's 1.30 already. Okay, so MI differs from traditional or typical medical counseling uh, because ambivalence is the key issue to be resolved for change to occur. Again, people are more likely to change when they hear their own discussion of their ambivalence, and that is called change talk, as I mentioned earlier in MI. And getting uh, patients or students to engage in change talk is a critical element of the MI process. One of the ways that we can explore ambivalence is by having a conversation like this. We're going to use some open-ended questions and we're going to first ask, I'm going to say, what are some of the good things about your marijuana use, your uh, opioid use, whatever it might be? Rather than, typically what people are used to is, don't you understand how bad this is for you? And instead of doing that, I'm going to say, I'm going to ask them, what are some of the good, what do you like about it? What are some of the good things about it? Because I want to understand. I want to understand what role the substance plays in the student's life. And then, okay, so now I understand that. Now help me understand some of the not so good things about it. See if they can come up with some things that are not so good. We use the words not so good instead of bad or negative because they're less judgmental and they're less likely to uh, make people's defenses come up. And then what would be some of the not so good things about cutting down or stopping? And then what would be the good things about stop cutting down or stopping? Um, the not so good things about cutting down or stopping will help us identify the challenges. Um, what are the obstacles going to be? And then what would be the good things? We want to end up on the positive side. So what would be the good things about cutting down or stopping? We're using open-ended questions, uh, affirmations, reflective listening, and summarizing, as we said earlier. Reflective listening, as I said, we, we're listening both to what the, the patient or the student says and to what they mean. 
we're demonstrating empathy without judging what they say. We don't necessarily have to agree with someone in order to empathize with them. Okay, I can understand how it seems that way from your perspective. Be aware of your intonation. So we're reflecting with statements rather than with questions. So listen to the difference in the way I say this. So you couldn't get up for work in the morning versus so you couldn't get up for work in the morning. This, the last one is a statement and it doesn't sound judgmental. When we ask a question, you couldn't get up for work in the morning? That can sound a little sarcastic or a little judgmental. And so we don't want to do that. So we're going to use statements for reflections um, rather than <clears throat> questions. And again, we're listening to understand, not to diagnose and fix a problem, which is how most healthcare interactions are structured or oriented. We're avoiding confrontation. We're, uh, we're not going to do the challenging thing. What do you think you're doing? You're not, we're not going to do the finger wagging thing. Do you want to be a good student? Do you need to stop drinking on school nights? We're not going to do that sort of lecturing, confrontational sort of stuff. We're going to elicit change talk, which, elicit, which consists of self-motivational statements that suggest that there is a problem. Maybe there's some, some concern about staying the same. Maybe there's an intention to change. And ultimately, we'd like there to be some optimism about change. Goal of brief interventions, I already did this earlier, so I'm going to skip this one. Okay, so one of the two brief intervention models that we're going to look at is called the FLOW model, or the FLO model. And F stands for feedback. So we're gonna set the stage for the conversation and give them the screening results. L stands for listen and understand. We're going to explore the pros and cons, explore the importance to them of changing and assess their readiness to change. And then O stands for options explored, discussing change options, we want to try to elicit those, if we can, from the, the student, as I said before, rather than telling them. But if they can't come up with any, then we might suggest some. Uh, and then establish a follow-up. So the three tasks of a brief, brief intervention, FLO. Feedback first. Ask permission to have the conversation. Um, and you're going to see in more detail what I mean by that when we go over the brief negotiated interview, which is what we're going to do next. Uh, so for the FLO model, we're asking permission, would it be okay if we talk about this subject? Communicates respect. Give them the feedback and then ask for their response to it. So on this score uh, of substance use, you scored in the, the moderately high range uh, with regard to other students who are in your age range. What do you make of that? What do you think about that? Need to cover the range of scores uh, and the context what their screening results were. Substance use norms and population don't apply so much to adolescents. Um, interpretation of results, in other words, what risk level. So if you are using something weekly or daily, you're at a high risk level. If you're using something on a monthly, maybe once or twice a month, you're at a moderate risk level. And then get their feedback about that. What do you make of that? Okay, this is uh, actually from the audit, which doesn't belong here, so we're going to skip that one. There's some good informational brochures for people who are in pre-contemplation or contemplation and either not considering that they have a problem yet or thinking, okay, maybe there is a problem here, but I'm not ready to do anything about it just yet. The NIAAA puts out an underage drinking fact sheet, which is available at the, the link on the slide. Uh, that's with regard to drinking, and SAMHSA puts out an underage drinking facts versus myths fact sheet. Um, they're good one-pagers just to have to hand out to students. Okay, handling resistance. Listen, I don't have a drug problem. My dad was an alcoholic. I'm not like him. I can quit using anytime I want to. I just like the taste. Everybody drinks in college or everybody drinks in high school. Uh, what do we say to some of those things? We want to avoid a tug of war, so we're going to let go and say something along these lines. Listen, I'm not going to push you to change anything you don't want to change. I'd just like to give you some information. Ultimately, what you do with it is up to you. How would that be, or is that okay? Ask them about their concerns. Give them non-judgmental feedback and information. Watch for signs of discomfort with the status quo or interest or ability to change. 
Always ask the question if they're coming in because of an injury. If you're seeing them, let's say, because of an injury, what role do you think your drinking or your other substance use played in your getting injured? Let them decide. And just asking the question is helpful. Remember that a lot of what we're doing in MI is planting seeds. Seeds are not necessarily going to sprout in one session, uh, but we are planting seeds that hopefully will sprout at some point. Okay, listen and understand is the second task. We're understanding that ambivalence is normal, and we're going to dig for change using the decisional balance. Oops, I forgot. This is where we have our ambivalent lady again, using open-ended questions. We're listening for a change talk. So we're listening for something like this. Maybe drinking did play a role in what happened, or if I wasn't drinking, this wouldn't have happened. Using really isn't much fun anymore. Anybody who's become a daily user, let's say, of opioids may say something along those lines. Uh, I can't afford to be in this mess again. Maybe this is a teachable moment. Maybe there's been some sort of negative consequence and this is a teachable moment. The last thing I wanna do is hurt somebody else. Or I know I can quit because I've done it before. And then we're gonna summarize and reflect back to them so that they hear it both from themselves and from us. Weighing the pros and cons, we've already covered this. Okay, this is called the importance and confidence and readiness ruler. Uh, we're going to ask one of these questions. On a scale of 1 to 10, how important is it for you to reduce or stop your drinking? If they seem like they are in maybe determination, thinking about making a change, thinking maybe they should make a change, how confident are you that you can do that? Or if they seem like they're really on board with making a change, how ready are you to do that? And then for each one, we're going to say, why didn't you give it a lower number? Typically, scores on this question range from four to six. So on a scale of one to 10, how important is it for you to change your drinking? Uh, four. Okay, great. So that's about 40% of the way there. Why didn't you give it a lower number? What people are typically expecting us to ask them is why didn't you give it a higher number, right? In other words, why isn't it more important to you? Which is kind of judgmental. And so instead, we're gonna say, why didn't you give it a lower number, like a one or a two, which gets them to think about what makes it important enough to give it a four? So we're getting them to think about the reason for the change. And then what would it take to bump that up from a four to a five? And uh, not from a four to a 10. What would it take to bump that up from a four to a five? Let's see if they can come up with one more reason why it would be important to make that change. The questions ultimately kind of lead to a working treatment plan. We'll understand what stage of change they're in. We'll understand what the benefits are to them of using R, what the consequences of using R, and we'll know how willing they are to work on the issue. So we'll get all of that out of the listen and understand piece. And then we'll go to options explored. And I'm going through this a little bit quickly because I wanna make sure that we get to brief, brief negotiated interview for somebody using Vicodin. Uh, options for change, what now? Again, we're gonna to try to elicit a course of action from them rather than telling them what they should do. What do you think you might do? What changes are you thinking about making? What, is you, what do you see as your options? Where do we go from here? Or what happens next? If they can't think of any, then we might offer a menu of options. So some people decide to manage their drinking, cut down to the lower risk limits. Some people decide to eliminate their drinking or drug use and quit altogether. Some people say they're never gonna drink and drive again. They're, so they're gonna reduce the harm associated with their uh, drinking or drug use. Uh, and some people decide they're going to do utterly nothing and make no changes. And other people decide that they're going to seek help and get a referral to treatment. Of those, what seems like it might be a reasonable course of action for you? Providing some advice, we're going to again ask permission to have the conversation. Would it be okay if I give you a suggestion or a recommendation? Provide the recommendation or suggestion and then ask for their response. And then we're going to sew the conversation up. We're going to summarize the patient's views, especially the pros about making a change, encourage them to share their views with other people. That's important. Share them with other people in their lives. And what agreement did we reach? Repeat it. So whether you do it verbally or you write it down, um, either way, what agreement did we reach? So that's the FLO brief intervention. 
The other one that you might make use of is, is called the brief negotiated interview, which is another form of brief intervention. Also makes use of a lot of the same MI skills and strategies, is just uh, formatted a little bit differently. So to BNI, we're going to start with engagement. Um, before we start and introduce yourself, ask permission to have the conversation. Before we start, I'd like to know a little bit more about you. Would you mind telling me a little bit about yourself? What's a typical day like for you? How does alcohol or drugs fit in? What are the most important things in your life right now? Start the conversation out rather than just diving straight into the alcohol or drug use. We want to engage with them. And we're going to explore the pros and cons. So I'd like to understand more about your use of Vicodin, marijuana, marijuana. What do you enjoy about it? What do you enjoy less about it or regret about your use? If, they're, if they can't think of any cons as opposed to pros, explore the problems that they mentioned on the craft. So you mentioned on the craft that you sometimes get in trouble because of your use of marijuana. Can you tell me more about that situation? And then summarize. So on one hand, you say you enjoy marijuana because it helps you relax and de-stress and forget about your family problems. And on the other hand, you say that it sometimes gets you in trouble because you uh, don't get your homework done and don't have a, an assignment uh, that you have to do the next day. Then we're gonna provide feedback. Again, we're gonna ask permission, provide the information and then elicit their response. I have some information about the guidelines for low, low risk drinking. Would you mind if I shared them with you? And then talk about the guidelines for adults. Um, it could also lead to problems with the law or with relationships in your life. What are your thoughts about that? And you use the readiness ruler to help me understand, better understand how you feel about making a change. Uh, show them the readiness ruler on a scale of one to 10. How ready are you to change any aspect related to your use of whatever, whatever their substance is? And again, that's great. It means you're 40%, 50% ready to make a change. Here again, we go to why did you choose that number and not a lower one like a one or a two? And then envision the change. Okay, so it sounds like you have some reasons to change. Re repeat it, reflect it back to them. Then we're gonna negotiate an action plan. What are you willing to do for now? To be healthy and safe. Okay, let's write those down for you. For you, and and it's it's more uh, useful typically to have them write them down than than for you to write them down. What do you want your life to look like down the road? Again, probing for goal, goals and values. How does this change fit with where you see yourself in the future? What are some challenges to reaching your goal? Let's see if we can figure out what the obstacles are going to be. And then draw on past successes. What have you done or planned in the past that you felt proud of? Not related to your substance use, but just in general. Who or what helped you to succeed? How can you use that person or method again to help you with the challenges of changing now? And if you make these changes, how would things be better? And then we're gonna summarize the conversation and thank them. Let me summarize what we've been discussing and you let me know if there's anything you wanna add or change go over the action plan that you develop with them. If, it's, if they're in the severe category, we might present a list of resource, treatment resources. Which of these services, if any, are you interested in following up with? Um, here's the action plan, give it to them that we discussed along with your goals. This is really an agreement between you and yourself. Thanks so much for sharing with me today. I know it's not easy to talk about this stuff. Okay, and here's an example of a brief negotiated interview with a teen using Vicodin in particular. Um, before we get started, I'd like to know a little bit more about you. So we're gonna engage with them uh, in the same way that we would with any, any other brief negotiated interview. What's a typical day like for you and how does Vicodin fit in? Pros and cons, I'd like to understand more about your use of Vicodin. What do you enjoy about it? What do you enjoy less about Vicodin or regret about your use of it? Again, if they can't think of any cons, explore the problems mentioned on the craft, like you said you've gotten in trouble while using Vicodin. Tell me a little bit more about that. Or you sometimes use Vicodin to fit in, to feel like you fit in, or so you don't feel alone. Uh, so on one hand, you enjoy Vicodin because it helps you with X, Y, and Z, and on the other hand, it has caused some problems for you. Provide feedback, I had some information about the use of opioids by teens that I'd like to share with you. Would that be okay? Again, asking permission, it just demonstrates respect. 
We know that use of opioids by teens has some negative consequences. For one thing, it's very easy to become addicted to them. And this is a really important point, to the point that you need them just to be able to function every day. They can lead to short-term problems like impaired ability to learn, poorer grades, and family relationship issues, along with overdose and death, and long-term consequences like collapsed veins, respiratory problems, and liver disease. Teens who use prescription opioids in their early teens are more likely to be using heroin by the time they graduate from high school. And because your brain is still developing, opioids can cause changes in your brain that may be permanent and make you more vulnerable to addiction as an adult. What are your thoughts about all of that? That's a lot of information. What do you think about all of that? Give them time to reflect on it. Don't press for a response immediately. Give them a little time to reflect on it if they need it. Use the readiness ruler. Again, same as we talked about earlier. Negotiate the action plan. Uh, what do you want your life to look like down the road? And how does this change fit in with those goals? Or how does continuing your use of Vicodin fit in with those goals? What might be some challenges in accomplishing your goal with regard to Vicodin? And then again, what's something in the past that you've accomplished that you felt proud of? How did you succeed in that? How can you use that person or method to help you with the challenges um, of making this change now? And so if you make this change, how would things be better for you? And then again, summarize and thank them for the conversation. Uh, so let me summarize what we've discussed. Let me know if there's anything you'd like to add or change. Again, go over the action plan with them and hand it to them if they, if they haven't, uh, if you have it and they don't have it. If available, present the list of local resources. Again, if they have scored in the severe range. Okay, here's the action plan we discussed. discussed. Again, this is really an agreement between you and yourself. Thanks so much for coming in and talking with me today. So those are two, and you, I know I went through those very quickly, uh, but those are two examples of brief interventions. Um, you can get the slide handouts, uh, and so you'll be able to see all of these steps on those handouts. About 5% of students that are screened will require referral to substance use evaluation and treatment. Student may be appropriate for referral when they report weekly or more use of a substance on the S2BI, or they score higher than two on the craft, uh, as we said earlier. Those high-risk students will get a brief intervention that is oriented toward a referral to treatment. Certainly anybody who's using something like Vicodin uh, every day or even several times a week, we probably want to put in that category. We want to do a warm handoff. To the extent that you can, know the treatment options available in your community, know what they are, develop relationships between school-based health centers who are doing screening and local treatment centers, facilitate a handoff by calling to make an appointment for the student, provide directions and clinic hours to them, maybe coordinate transportation if needed, uh, and if that's something that's available for you to be able to do, and, and then see if you can think of any other useful referral strategies. Okay, we'll just finish up with advocating for SBIRT. Uh, I know we're running a little bit short on time. I'm actually going to skip over that. Possible SBIRT settings, we can access adolescents in medical settings and clinics, schools, and, and the juvenile justice system is another big place where we do screening and brief intervention. Uh, we've already talked about why do prevention for adolescents in school settings. Time and resources are essential for SBIRT to succeed. You really need to have a champion, somebody who is going to advocate uh, with your staff and with your administration to, uh, to implement SBIRT. You need the space for it. You need to do training for it. Um, you need the time to deliver it, and you need to be able to integrate it into your other workflow. Make the case for SBIRT with school administrators. Um, it's a public health approach to substance use and it's ultimately going to benefit student health and well-being. And you might emphasize the potential impact uh, on issues of concern to the school like dropouts and how they're caused or aggravated by substance use. Okay, identify and engage community leaders who are concerned with substance use. Uh, that can help create momentum to tackle the issue. That might be politicians, school boards, school nursing associations, Community, other community leaders, parent, teachers, associations. Again, emphasize that this is a public health approach to improving student health and wellness. It's not just say no, it's, a, it's something different. 
launch a public health campaign to increase public awareness, uh, generate interest among providers to deliver expert by engaging professional associations that you may be members of, reference the endorsement of youth expert by national organizations like the American Academy of Pediatrics, the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, and the National Institute on Drug Abuse. Community Catalyst is a great organization. They're an advocacy organization that focuses on healthcare issues. They have a lot of tools um, and they have a lot of tools in terms of mobilizing for SBIRT on their website. And the link is there on that slide. Some tips for advocates, the Community Catalyst uh, organization, tips for advocates and decision makers on advocacy. Providing effectiveness on the effectiveness of SBIRT. Um, that's a, a document that is available on uh, Google Drive. Some other resources, an adolescent SBIRT toolkit from Boston Children's Hospital is available. And there is, uh, we have an SBIRT resource hub uh, based on a project that we at we UCLA did with the Hilton Foundation a few years ago. And there are a lot of good resources there. So there's the website for that as well. Okay, and the end code. I know that was a lot to get through in a short period of time. The end code is 6732. Again, for those of you who would like continuing education units, uh, please write that down because you'll be asked for it on the CE evaluation. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Sierra. Okay. And let me stop sharing my slides. Fantastic. There we go. Yes. All right. All right, let's get into this. Okay, so I'm just gonna add on another resource um, that you all can use for substance use prevention. This is uh, part of CSHA's Youth Health Worker Curriculum, which is a peer health education curriculum, meaning that it's meant for youth to train other youth. Uh, there's two sections. The section that we're gonna be focusing on today is a topical area, so we're going to substance use prevention. In the to topic areas, there's other things like mental health, community health, um, things along that lines. And then Learn Me Practice is the second half of the Youth Health Worker curriculum, which goes over different health careers. Okay, so today we're going to be going over uh, the What's Up or Substance Use Prevention module. Um, and I'll share it in just a second. This is there were two versions that were created for this. We had a in-person uh, version that was the way that most of our youth health worker modules are implemented. However, due to COVID, we transitioned into a module that was meant to be implemented virtually. Um, I am going to go ahead and share in the link right now the... Um, that, that's the link to the module that I'm going to be speaking about, but I'm also going to be sharing my screen um, so you all can see the module itself. Okay, fantastic. So this is the What's Up module, and you all now have a link to it so you can download it and access it and use it on your own. Again, it's a peer health education module. Um, okay, and so I'm just briefly, this is a very brief training on how to use this um, this module. There's a pretest here. Uh, there's also a post test at the end. They're identical. This is just to measure the of the students that um, that complete the module. Uh, one thing I do want to highlight: this goes over like check-in and icebreaker. Also, establishing community agreements is important because oftentimes these can be sensitive topic areas, and so just making sure that uh, you're establishing those agreements prior to starting the conversation. I'm going to go a little bit more in depth about each of these activities here. Um, so let's just go ahead and move right into that. Um, okay, so the first, the first activity is on substance use and harm reduction. And um, the way that they're going to learn about uh, substance substances and substance use is through a game of Jeopardy. Uh, for the sake of time, I am not going to click on this link and show it to you, but you can click on it on your own, on your own time and you can see how uh, the Jeopardy game works. Um, this numbers four, five, four and five are basically just going over how to play the game. And you'll see, so 
For those of you who are familiar with Jeopardy, there's different categories up at the top. Um, the first category is examples, uh, which uh, will give you examples of a substance and you have to guess what the substance is. So for instance, it'll say Oxycontin and Vicodin, you have to guess what type of substance that is, which would be opioids. Um, also known as will give you other names of substances known by and you'll have to guess what the substance is. So it'll say like, uh, what's another, what's the substance for um, the terms like blunt and chronic? And then it'll say marijuana um, will be the answer. Effects gives you uh, short-term and long-term effects. And you have to guess what substances have those side effects. And there's more than one answer for these questions. So um, for instance, like loss of coordination could be a short-term side effect for uh, alcohol use, but there's also a lot of other substances that have that side effect. So there's multiple answers for those questions. Addictive and overdose is just true and false questions about whether or not a substance you can is addictive and or you can overdose from. Um, harm reduction, um, which is a set of practices and services aimed at reducing the negative effects of substance use. Uh, it kind of, it'll give you like a category, uh, something along the lines is like, what how would you reduce harm uh, related to friends? And then the answer could be something along the lines is like, don't use substances alone or make sure you're with friends that you trust. And I think right here, actually, these are all of the questions and answers under each of the topic areas. So you can go ahead and, um, and read those on your own time, okay. I am just looking at the time right now and I am going to try to do this as quickly as possible. I just want to point out that we go over the yes means yes law here. This is really important. We have a lot of students ask this question. Um, so please make sure that you're touching on this topic when you go through it. This is the common substances handout, um, which goes over everything that's in the Jeopardy game and then some. We encourage you to give this to students after they play the game so that you can kind of see where their knowledge assessment is prior to, and this gives this gives essentially all the answers after the game. Um, the next the next section goes over substance use, misuse, and de uh, dependence, and it goes over the different levels and how they're defined. You can see the definitions here, um, which we pulled from NIDA, and then it tests scenarios through a game of Kahoot. Again, here's all the questions that are in the Kahoot game and the answers. Um, and the last activity is about addiction as a disease. Um, it goes over the definition of stigma. And then um, we talk about a little bit about the war on drugs. And we show this video here um, through the drug that's created through the Drug Policy Alliance. Um, and then and then we have them talk a little bit so you can share these scenarios, which are stigmatized scenarios and talk about like how that can be an ax uh, sorry, a barrier to accessing care. And then, so there's war on drugs, stigma scenarios, and then you're gonna talk a little bit about um, addiction as a disease, which comes with another video. And then you'll revisit those uh, well, you'll revisit the scenarios that you went over earlier and talk about how maybe the approach would be different if these people knew that addiction was a disease and how to respond to that. And then lastly, um, sharing information about your school-based health center and how to access services if they themselves or if they know of anyone who, um, who might need access to services. Okay, now I'm going to stop and I'm going to share back my screen with the... Um, Oh, okay. I'll, sh I'll put this um, up in the chat later, but this is expert quick guides, which are uh, located on our website and they go over a lot of what Jim talked about today. Um, we wanna thank the Your California Project for sponsoring this. And then this is the last thing that I wanted to show is that this is where you are going to get your continuing education, um, oops, sorry, your continuing education units I'll share this link in the chat right now. You need to get eight out of 10 to pass. Um, and there's also a course evaluation that you need to fill out. So let me go ahead and put this in the chat. Um, one second. Sorry. There we go. 
there is the link to the, fill out the course evaluation. So thank you all for uh, attending today. Um, and we, we really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks everyone for being here.